Okay, so hi everybody. I'm Zach. Um, this is this is where you are. If this isn't where you thought you were, then you know, I mean, you can still hang out. We can still have fun together. Um, so we're going to talk about um, a bunch of kind of dynamic C physics -y things in this class, and um, it's a bit of a kind of like idiosyncratic uh, things that I think are important to kind of take on this subject, which. Hopefully, you know, you, we all agree on that, but we might not. It's probably a different flavor from other dynamics classes you will have seen, but I think it's all super useful and practical stuff. That's kind of, I try to make it super practical. So the homework, sir, oh, we'll, we'll get into that. Oh. Anyway, bonus points, if anyone knows what that thing on the left is. Anyone know what that is? No, you will, you will learn at some point in this class what that is. Uh, okay, so no one gets the bonus point but you'll, you'll get it later. Okay, so I'm Zach, we did that. Uh, Anthony, who's sitting back there, is gonna be the TA. Uh, so he's gonna do office hours and homework stuff. I'll also do office hours and all that good stuff. Um, so yeah, uh, I figured it'd be fun to start out with kind of a, I don't know, a brief history of dynamics as like a little, you know, um, intro teaser to the topic. So in the beginning, there was, uh, you know, Isaac Newton, um, this guy, everyone knows this, right? Um, so wait a minute, ah, sorry, annoying projector things are in my way and I can't, why am I bad at this? I feel like it's just serious old man vibes here. Okay. Okay, there we go. Okay, so anyone know uh, when the Principia was written, just for fun? It's like, uh, so as first, published in like 1687. And arguably this was like the foundation of, you know, all of modern science basically, right? Like modern physics and everything. That's kind of the, the birthplace of, you know, physics, analytic geometry, you know, calculus, uh, lots of lots of things, right? And this is where we get um, F equals MA. Uh, it also dealt with uh, gravitation and orbit mechanics back then um, and pendula and like viscous damping. Basically, all the stuff you learned in like freshman mechanics was in this book, you know, like 350 years ago, which is kind of awesome. Um, I actually, I think calculus, there's no calculus in this book, actually. That's all actually wrong. It's all geometric proofs, which is kind of wild and, and kind of cool. Um, and all done with kind of like these kind of vectorial pictures and stuff like that and, and geometry stuff. Kind of fun. Okay, so what came next? Uh, that work? Nope. Nope, nothing works. Okay, sorry. I really am striking out today on the... Okay, there we go. So uh, this was the next kind of uh, major chapter in our story. This is uh, Lagrange um, and a bunch of this stuff. Uh, so this was about a hundred years later, hundred years after Newton. So this is like 1780s when this was published. Um, and I don't know what the, the big story here is. You guys have like seen some of this before. So the big deal here is that um, this book, so whereas the Newton stuff had lots of pictures and was very like draw vectors and stuff like that, uh, Lagrange was sort of super analytic and, and algebraic and bragged about having no pictures in his book, in fact, in like a, a forward to the book. So this was kind of analytic mechanics where that kind of thing started. Um, who knows what that is? Somebody's got to know what that is. That's the famous Euler-Lagrange equation, right? Do, do you know like what that is or where that comes from? Uh, no, not originally, actually. So that's like how you learn it in like uh, a lot of physics classes at the like upper level, undergrad level. And that's completely ahistorical. Like that whole variational thing didn't come to like 100 years after this. So this originally came from taking F equals MA, which is explicitly sort of in Cartesian coordinates and trying to make it coordinate invariant. So basically plugging in like a coordinate transformation uh, to some arbitrary coordinates Q that can be whatever you want. And then kind of a turning the crank to see what a coordinate invariant version of F equals MA would look like. And that's where, that's where this originally comes from. And there are some books that derive it that way, but that's kind of the historical version of this. Um, so this was a major advancement over Newton's second law, if it was MA stuff. 
because of this coordinate invariant thing. And we're going to play around with this and you'll see kind of why this is such a big deal. But this is why you still learn this in like sort of senior level mechanics courses and why it's super widely applied in mechanical engineering contexts and, and all that good stuff. It means that you get to pick your coordinates to be whatever you want, which is super powerful. And it gets us away from drawing little free body diagrams of vectors and lets us uh, handle much more complicated uh, systems. Um, Let's see, what else is there to say about this? Yeah, super practical. We're going to do a bunch of this stuff. Probably a lot of you have seen this before. The next chapter in our story uh, is about another 50 years after Lagrange. Uh, this is so this is like 1830s. And uh, does anyone know what this guy is, who this guy is and what this is? This is Hamilton, famous for two things, uh, both of which we'll talk about in the class. One is this guy. Does anyone know what that thing is? That's the action integral, but yeah, the, this thing is actually the least action principle or stationary action principle. So what Hamilton did uh, was take this thing, which, you know, Lagrange, Euler Lagrange equation, which originally came from F equals MA and this whole coordinate invariance thing that we talked about. Basically what he did was take this equation and, and realize through some magical intuition or whatever that, um, this guy, this, this Euler Lagrange guy, is actually the first order necessary conditions, aka set the gradient equal to zero uh, for, for an optimization problem, which is this least action thing. So if I minimize this thing up here, this S thing, if I treat that as like a cost function or, or loss function or whatever you want to call it, um, and minimize it with respect to the trajectory Q of T, if I do that, the first order necessary conditions for a, a local optimum is gradient equals zero. That's this guy. If I set that gradient equal to zero, it turns out up pops this guy. So Hamilton's sort of the big idea from, from Hamilton here is that we can actually pose dynamics as optimization. Um, and this is cool because it generalizes in a lot of different directions. It lets you now think about adding constraints to this problem in all kinds of ways. Um, we can use other weird coordinates. We can make the velocities and the positions have different coordinates if we want to. Uh, we can do all kinds of weird things. And it turns out uh, pretty much every formulation of mechanics you've ever heard of past the Lagrangian thing. So who's heard of some other ones, other ways to get equations of motion? Hamilton Jacoby, yeah, that's actually, it's a special one that we'll talk about maybe a little bit. Any other ones? People have heard of like the Hamilton, you know, Hamiltonian equations of motion. Have you heard of Keynes equations or um, the uh, principle of, you know, uh, least constraint? There's all kinds of these things. It turns out basically all of them are um, special cases of this guy where you make certain assumptions about your coordinates or your velocities or whatever, and then turn the crank on setting the gradient equal to zero. So this is kind of the most general setup right here. And almost everything else can be derived from this. Super cool. The other thing to say about this is it provides um, uh, kind of a really interesting bridge between mechanics, dynamics, and optimization, right? So we turn mechanics into an optimization problem. Turns out that's a pretty rich vein that you can mine. And uh, right up to the present day, like in the last 20 years, there's been a lot of work in this sort of direction that uh, exploits kind of deep connections between mechanics and optimal control and um, lets you derive kind of this the, the basically the most state-of-the-art numerical integrators like simulation you know kind of tools for for integrating these kind of uh, equations of motion come from this picture and from like treating things like optimization problems okay so this is kind of the classic stuff uh, and I'd say this is roughly where classical mechanics ends in physics, but um, it kept going in engineering. So anyone heard of this guy? Thomas Kane? Kane's equations? Nobody? OK, so this is kind of fun. Uh, Thomas Kane, that's him. Uh, I think he's, he, he made, I think he only died a couple of years ago. So this work was done like in the, he was active like in the 50s through 70s. He was a professor at Stanford. and. Uh, came up with another formulation of classical mechanics called Keynes equations uh, that are actually super popular in uh, in aerospace engineering 
and have also been widely used in robotics and in different eras and things like this. Uh, he's famous for a couple of things. One is Keynes equations. The other is for actually giving the first definitive solution to the falling cat problem. You ever heard of this? It's super famous, right? Cats always land on their feet, blah, blah, blah. So if you're naive about that, uh, so yeah, by the way, that's a classical like paradoxical problem, right? So the paradox is if you have conservation of angular momentum and you have cat dropped upside down, how does the cat flip itself over without like violating conservation of, of angular momentum? Anyone have any thoughts? That's the paradox. Anyone know? Tail what? Uh, so that's kind of the right intuition. Basically, the story is the cat is not a rigid body and therefore can manipulate internal degrees of freedom um, and like reorient itself while still conserving angular momentum. So, so the tail idea is it's actually not the tail. Turns out uh, this is the toy model for falling back. It's like a weird dumbbell with a, like a universal joint in the middle. So it turns out what it's doing is basically arching its back and then rotating its, its spine. Um, and that's what lets it do this maneuver. Uh, and so anyway, the cane actually was the first sort of rigorous mathematical treatment of the, that like solved the falling cat problem. That was in like the early 1960s, which is kind of insane that this paradox that seemingly isn't that, doesn't sound that crazy. Like, and this subject is over 300 years old, right? Like this problem wasn't resolved until the 1960s. Turns out there's a few other weirdo mechanics, class of mechanics paradoxes that are still kind of sketchy and interesting and, and fun. So Thomas Kane, um, one of the other big things about Kane's equations, which we might like touch on, um, but again, they're just a special case of that whole like Euler Lagrange, like Hamilton thing. Um, what they do specifically, if you're if you're wondering, is in the Euler Lagrange equation that we we wrote down over here, you pick coordinates Q. But once you've picked your coordinates, your velocities have to be the Q dots, right? That turns out not to be convenient in a lot of cases. And in a lot of cases, you actually want to have different Qs. Uh, you want to have actually different velocities be from, from your Q dots. You want to be able to independently choose your velocity variables and your position coordinates and not have to have the Vs equal to the Q dots. So Kane's equation lets you do that. It basically generalizes that Euler-Lagrange equation to have different Qs and Vs that you can choose independently. Uh, one of the fun things about this that's maybe even more famous than the equations themselves is that um, this work was like, you know, 60s into the 70s, the very dawn of kind of the computer age. And um, one of uh, Kane's students, this guy, uh, Levinson, who I actually got to meet and hang out with uh, once or twice, um, developed a software package that was the first sort of like algorithmic uh, package for like generating equations of motion and solving, you know, dynamics problems like automatically. It was called Autolev. And um, it was, it's still used in, in industry. And like uh, now there's a company that kind of spun it off into a, another product called uh, Motion Genesis, if anyone's seen this or come across it in internships or whatever, it's still around. Um, and so, one of the big things there is that these were the, this was the first, like these guys are basically the first people to like really try doing this stuff in a computer in a serious way and um, focus on computational efficiency uh, in, in like simulation and, and like formulating of equations of motion. So these guys were the, the first ones to kind of bring dynamics into the computer age, which is kind of cool. And there's, there's a, a, a whole other thread there that, that continues. Uh, some other stuff, we'll talk about this maybe a little bit. Um, you haven't seen this guy before? This book is terrifying. This is the, the famous Arnold book. Yeah, so you, you, you've checked this out? Yeah, there's, and yeah, so this book is sort of the, the most classic uh, book on what, what's kind of called geometric mechanics and kind of treats, um, uh, it, it's a, it uses tools from differential geometry to sort of attack uh, classical mechanics and is probably still one of the most mathematically sophisticated books on the on classical mechanics out there. Um, so Arnold kind of kicked this off. He's famous for this thing called the, the KAM theorem. Kolmogorov, um, Arnold, and Moser, who's another one of these guys in the 60s that has to do with like um, chaos and perturbation theory and stuff like this. 
Um, but yeah, kind of this stuff's super cool and super pretty. And basically, like, uh, is there anyone know what this thing is? It's a torus, a two torus. So it turns out that is the uh, configuration space for a double pendulum. So a double pendulum has two angles, like a theta one and a theta two. Topologically, that's a torus, right? You've got theta one, say, in blue, and theta two in red. So if you think like geometrically, that's that's actually the space that the dynamics of a double pendulum evolve on. So this is kind of the perspective. It turns out by like looking at things like from this perspective, this geometric perspective, right? Um, there's a lot of cool things you can do. There's there's really beautiful theory, but the math is like pretty rough, and the notation is is particularly rough. So we might we'll we'll dabble in this stuff a little bit, but we're not going to like go too too crazy. Um, but yeah, the, the big thing here is that what these good tools can do for you is kind of provide a lot of insight into the kind of like structure of, of the solutions to these equations, even in cases where you can't solve the ODEs explicitly, right? So you can't get a closed form solution. You might be numerically integrating them in a computer, but there's still a bunch of structure in there, right? A lot of geometry kind of stuff like this. And this can give you insights into like conserved quantities, right? Um, conservation laws, symmetries of the system, things like that, that can help you sort of think about the dynamics in qualitative ways that are kind of interesting. So, okay, so that's sort of geometric mechanics. This is 20th century stuff, uh, 60s, 70s, 80s. Um, another thread coming from computer science. Anyone heard of this guy, Featherstone? Okay, so yes, a couple of people. No, okay, so uh, Roy Featherstone, this is like late 80s. Um, he's still around, still doing it. Um, he developed uh, the first uh, general linear time algorithms for uh, for dynamics. So um, what kind of the idea here is, and this is coming from robotics now. So the idea here is if you have like a robot arm, um, this thing is what we call an open kinematic chain. So there's no, no loops. Turns out that there's a bunch of sort of topology and graph structure there that you can exploit um, in order to uh, solve the equations of motion. So if you're going to like simulate a system in uh, linear time in the number of degrees of freedom, it turns out you can do that in general for a, an open kinematic chain. So anything that doesn't have loops, which is humans, you know, quadrupeds, most you know, robot arms, things like this. Um, which is pretty cool. It turns out, does anyone know what the complexity is if you don't do this clever stuff? It's actually fun. It's it's actually easy to show this, but does anyone know offhand? It's cubic. So if you can go from cubic to linear for a big system, right? If you have like a humanoid robot with like, you know, 40, 50, 80 degrees of freedom, that's, you know, 80 is, is much smaller than 80 cubed, right? So it's a big win. Um, does anyone know where that cubic complexity comes from? It's a fun one. Okay, so in order to get like Q double dot or velocity, you know, accelerations out of equations of motion, you have to invert the mass matrix. And that's N by N in the state dimension and inverting a matrix or solving a linear system is cubic in M, right? So if you just write down, you know, euler lagrange stuff, you get a mass matrix, it's cubic because you have to invert that thing. Um, and basically by being super clever with like, you know, tree structure and stuff like this, it turns out you can basically solve that linear system effectively or factorize that matrix uh, in linear time, which is cool. Uh, what else is there to say about this? Uh, so, okay, so Featherstone, that book, there's a newer edition of this too. It's pretty recent, last couple of years. Um, did that in what, what are called minimal coordinates or joint coordinates or generalized coordinates. And then in the 90s, a guy named David Barreth, who was a professor here in RI, um, showed how to do uh, do this in linear time in uh, max, so-called maximal coordinates, where you basically write down the full sort of uh, coordinate representation for every link in the robot, and then write down explicit joint constraints with Lagrange yeah. multipliers. So he showed how to do linear time stuff in that context, sort of early 90s. And, and the whole story behind this, though, is sort of exploiting this kind of graph structure stuff in the system. That's kind of the idea. OK, so that stuff, what else is there to talk about? Okay, another line of work that's sort of, again, from the robotic side of things, it turns out, you know, in robotics, we care a lot about this kind of stuff, impacts and friction. Has anyone ever tried writing down or simulating systems with impacts and friction, like walking or grasping or, yeah, a little bit? 
Um, so if we're being super rigorous, uh, you know, we're thinking rigid bodies. What happens to my velocity when I do this? It's a rigid body. Yeah, it instantaneously goes from whatever at like t plus epsilon, you know, to like zero right? when it hits under the rigid body assumption, which is idealized and blah, blah, blah. But that's a pretty good approximation to most things in robotics, right? So it turns out, strictly speaking, with that velocity discontinuity, what, what are my accelerations? And if I try to write that down with F equals MA, falling brick, falling brick, what happens at the instant of impact to F equals MA? Yeah, so it turns out, rigorously speaking, you can't do F equals MA here. It doesn't work, right? You get like infinite spiky things. Um, if you want to be mathematically rigorous about it, uh, you have to think about these things called measured differential inclusions. and we don't want to do that, so uh, we're not going to go there. But basically, this gets really weird, and there's a lot of like pretty, pretty gnarly math if you want to be, treat it rigorously. And um, you can't quite apply vanilla F equals MA to these things, uh, assuming you know idealized rigid bodies. What actually happens in reality, right, is that these things all deform a little bit, and there's a little compliance and a little give and like internal degrees of freedom and you know whatever that's dissipating energy into like vibration modes and bending modes in the objects and stuff like that, right? So, uh, but to do that, you have to like, you know, resolve these really fast, really fine scale dynamics in the objects. And we don't do that, right? We don't want to do that. We don't want to have to like, think about the, you know, vibration modes of the feet in my robot that are, you know, tens of kilohertz or whatever, right? Uh, in order to simulate walking and we, we don't, right? So it turns out that the rigid body assumptions are, are still pretty good here, but a lot of weird things happen. So. The first really mathematically rigorous treatment of this stuff happened in the 1970s uh, by a French guy named Moreau. Um, and he developed this thing called the maximum dissipation principle, which is the sort of rigorous analytic, you know, uh, variational theory uh, that, that lets you describe stuff like this. Um, and surprise, surprise, it's an optimization problem. And we'll talk about that. And then in the 90s, the first actually usable um, general simulation tools for stuff like this came out. Um, uh, the, the seminal paper is Stuart and Trinkle, which is like 1997 or 8. And then there was a follow-up one in, in 2000 that kind of fixed some bugs in the original paper. So really, we're talking like the first you know stuff to do this rigorously wasn't until like 20 years ago, right? Like kind of interesting. Um, and these are called time-stepping methods, which is kind of ambiguous and not very descriptive. But uh, that's what they're called. Uh, what else is there to say about that? And that's actually what's underlying a lot of current robotic simulators, particularly uh, Bullet, if you guys are familiar with Pi Bullet or whatever. That uses uh, Dart also, um, uh, does this uh, time stepping stuff uh, of, of Stuart and Trinkle fame. Uh, okay, what else is there to say about things? Okay, uh, other fun and weird things that we will do in this class. Um, I mentioned the like geometric mechanics stuff. It turns out there's uh, a whole body of work on deriving numerical simulation methods, AKA uh, numerical integration schemes uh, from those ideas that conserve energy and momentum and all this good stuff. So what you're seeing here is like um, a sort of standard say like, you know, ODE 45 and that last type thing compared to like a, a variation on the grid. See there's like tons of drift in the momentum energy. Whereas this like variational integrator is, is exactly conserved to machine precision, conserving all of the conserved things, right? Um, so that kind of comes from that geometric picture. Uh, yeah, that's like a weird phase space illustration of, of this on a pendulum on top with a cat face. From the, uh, the cat face thing actually comes from the Arnold book. And it, it became kind of like a meme in, in mechanics books ever since. So I think this particular cat face thing is from is not from the Arnold book. They stole the cat meme from the Arnold book. Uh, anyway, so yeah, we're we're gonna go kind of deep on this on these like structure preserving numerical integration methods because I'm into them. I think they're super cool and useful, um, but they're not widely used, which I think is a bummer. So maybe you guys will will fix that. Okay, so this is my weirdo whirlwind tour of uh, of mechanics topics that we're gonna cover in you know one way or another. Um, so I'm like more logistical things. So High level, what we're going to do, uh, a bunch of sort of rigid and multi-body dynamics things. Particularly, we're going to cover constraints and contact 
So all that impact friction stuff that happens in robotics that's super gnarly and weird and hard to simulate, we're going to do it the right way um, so that you guys don't have to like use hacky, you know, Mujoko things or spring damper models or whatever that, that are terrible. Um, we'll do, you know, kind of the classical analytic stuff, so like the Lagrangian Hamiltonian stuff. And then we'll take a tour through kind of a bunch of like kind of modern or state of the art uh, algorithmic ideas. So these discrete mechanics things, these structure preserving integrators, the linear time algorithms, the Featherstone stuff I mentioned, right? Um, and these time stepping methods for simulating contact. So basically, like you will have the tools to like build your own state of the art, you know, simulation of whatever thing you you care about, like whatever robotic system you care about. That's kind of the idea. And again, yeah, like a lot of focus on numerical methods implementation. We're gonna the homeworks will be code based, like implement algorithms and try stuff out, and like you know stuff that's heavily biased towards robotics applications. So we'll do a lot of case studies with like drones and you know arms and uh, legged robots and all this kind of stuff, um, which hopefully is what we're all into here. Uh, uh, okay, so yeah, there, there'll be like four homeworks. Uh, and there won't be a final uh, exam or anything. We're going to do a course project. And um, the idea there is you can do it in a group. You can do it by yourself, kind of up to you. Um, I said up to four. There's no, that's an arbitrary cutoff. If, if you have five friends and you really want to work together, I we can do that. That's fine. Come talk to me. The idea here, though, is to basically, it's super open-ended. Do a project on something that you think is cool using stuff from class. That is it. So uh, the, the intention is it's a graduate course. And what I hope is that you guys are sort of doing research where these ideas and, and stuff we're gonna talk about in here is useful for you and your research. So um, the idea is not to make you do more work or you know whatever. The idea is for you to like get something out of this class and use the stuff in your own research. So I, the hope is that you can kind of like spin a conference paper out of this. Um, so do something cool and relevant to you that you think is interesting and hopefully it overlaps with your the research, you know, you'll write it up for the class project and hopefully you can kind of like take that and go submit it to something. Uh, any questions about any of this stuff? It's kind of the gist of it. Homeworks to be up like every two weeks and then the end they'll, you know, sort of stop giving you homework so you can work on the project towards the end. Uh, I think that's kind of it. Any questions about topics, this stuff, all good? Okay, and then I think the last logistics stuff, you found the room, so that's good. Um, I'm also going to live stream it on Zoom because I've been doing it for the last year and a half, and it's easy enough, so I figured there's no reason not to. Um, so I'm doing that now. I'll post the links and stuff. Uh, and I'm also going to, I'm also recording them, and I'll post them on YouTube. So, you know, you can go back later or whatever. If you're sick or something, you can watch them there. Um, I'm going to write notes on an iPad, which I think thankfully got working after much struggle today. Uh, so I'll post the notes also online. Um, I like using Slack and kind of hate Canvas and Piazza. So given the course size, I think that's manageable. Um, we used Piazza for the last class because it was huge and Slack was unwieldy, but I think there's a manageable size. So we'll go back to Slack. Um, so Slack for, you know, you can bug me, you can bug Anthony on there, you can bug each other. Um, Homework will be done through GitHub because it's mostly going to be like Jupyter Notebook stuff. Um, and then we'll set up office hours sort of TBD based on doing some, some polling of you guys. Any questions about this stuff? Straightforward. Cool. Okay. Now you get to do something. Uh, so I think if we could all do this real quick or at the very least snap a picture of this or I'll post it. Um, number one is there's this Google form thing that's just me bugging you about some questions about your background and like stuff you already know about and then stuff you you're into and want to learn about maybe uh and then the second thing is just join the slack because i uh will that's where all announcements and things will be um i'll leave this up for a second hopefully you guys can like grab those links Yeah, pretty good. Yeah. All right, cool. That is it for the introduction. Now I get to try to make my iPad work. <laughs>
Uh, is this working? It does not appear to want to cooperate. Can't win. Uh, sorry, guys. Why? Why do you have to suck this much? Uh, this is awkward. I don't have any good jokes. No. Hmm. Yeah, this is really, really irritating. Sorry. I did this last night at home and it worked. Let's try again. Okay. No. Yeah. There you go. Do you know what the lines on it are called? Okay. Yeah, yeah. You got it. That's the uh so yeah, that's yeah, you, you win you win a bonus bonus prize. As yet to be determined bonus prize. <laughs> Uh, so yeah, that is the, so if you take a rigid body that, you know, tumbles or whatever in general, right, and you don't exert any torques or anything, angular momentum is conserved. So angular momentum is, you know, the norm of the angular momentum vector is conserved. So uh, a constant norm vector in R3, it's a sphere, right? So what that tells you is going back to this geometric mechanics stuff is that the trajectories for that rigid body have to lie on the surface of that momentum sphere, right, because of conservation of angular momentum. So those lines are a bunch of trajectories uh, of a tumbling rigid body. It, they look like you know random tumbling, you know, but when you look at it on that sphere, it actually cleans up super nicely, and they look like little Pringles slices. Um, the red lines, which now you can't see it, so this is like we'll do this. The red lines are are fancy uh, things called separatrices uh, that we'll maybe talk about later. It's kind of fun. They're also called. Uh, homoclinic and heteroclinic connections, if you want to be super fancy. Uh, that's like that geometric mechanics sort of lingo. Okay, I think it's gonna work, guys. I think, I believe. Okay, can everyone see, everyone see this okay? Yeah, we'll give it a shot. Okay, so here's, let's, so um, I figured we're gonna start off and uh, yeah, why? Why is this so awful? Okay, we're gonna start off like nice and easy, keep things light today, and and sort of do like a little Newtonian mechanics review. So this is like you know F equals ma stuff that I very much expect everyone to know, and I'm just gonna kind of highlight a few topics of interest and like point some things out, and then where we're gonna go next time I think should be generally new for people. So. Um, And again, I'm gonna post this stuff online too, so don't stress out about copying down all my horrible scribbles and stuff. I'd much rather you like bug me with questions and speak up and stuff. Okay, so the, the Newtonian mechanics thing, the classic F equals MA thing, what that really is, is about is describing um, the motion of particles or um, AKA uh, point masses. So, and what we mean by this, right, is things that have mass, but no physical extent, right? No volume, just like infinitesimal little points of mass. That's what F equals MA is about. So when we say particle, there's a particular like mathematical meaning to that. 
uh, which is when we talk about when we talk about writing down like the configuration or state of a particle, the only sort of information we need there is a position, a single position vector, right? To describe the, you know, kind of where this thing is, its configuration, right? And for now, we're going to write that as a little vector guy like this. Um, and if this thing did have some physical extent, right, if it did have some volume or whatever and took up some space, just a position wouldn't be enough anymore, right? We'd need some more numbers in the configuration to, like, uniquely specify, you know, where this thing was and stuff, right? So in particular, right, if it had physical volume and it was a rigid body, now it has a position and an orientation, right? So now we need, you know, more numbers. Uh, if it's a non-rigid body, it gets even more complicated and you have to write down like, you know, the configuration of various bending modes and stuff like that, right? So point mass means, or particle means it only has a position. Uh, and then to sort of like, um, just some notational things, this guy here, because um, it's going to sort of, we're going to, play some games with coordinates. This R with the little vector guy on top, we're going to call this an abstract vector. Uh, and so we are, uh, the meaning of that will be hopefully clear in a sec. So abstract vector means it's not, uh, it's not a set of numbers, you know, stacked up. It's some it's a it's a like arrow out there in space without a coordinate frame attached to it right it's, it is a like position thing right that that's sort of an abstraction it doesn't have sort of particular numbers attached to it that's what i mean by that um so we can write down uh f equals ma in this sort of coordinate free form i.e. in terms of like these abstract vector things that don't have numbers that are just kind of little arrows. So this is mass, right? And if we assume, uh, and then the other thing is is velocity in there. We're going to be sort of like super pedantic for some of this stuff to like get mutation down. Um, this guy in here is the velocity now. Also a weirdo abstract vector. Uh, this whole thing, and V in there is the time derivative of the momentum. And this is all stuff that I'm sure you guys know. OK, so uh, if we assume that the mass is constant, which isn't always the case, and there's there's one problem where it's not that's like a classic, which is the, the rocket equation, which is a fun one. Um, that we get you can pull the m out and we get the classic f equals ma thing right okay so this was all in sort of weirdo abstract vector land, and we can't actually do anything with this uh, at this point, right? So um, write that down. We can't actually do any computation. Uh, until we choose coordinates, 
So we're going to be like super explicit about this, at least for a little while. Uh, so let's pick some coordinates. And the, the most classic choice would be Cartesian coordinates. So let's do just like in 2D for now. So we're going to take this position vector R, which is this abstract arrow thing, and we're going to resolve it into uh, standard XY Cartesian coordinates. And the way that looks, we've got, a say, an X component, which is a scalar. And then we're going to have these unit vector things. So this is the X unit vector. And then we're going to do the same thing with the Ys. And I expect like you guys have seen stuff like this before. Uh, so we've got these things, which are scalars, uh, and we call these components, right? And then we've got these things, which are vectors, uh, unit vectors. And these we call basis vectors. And another way of writing this down, right? You can think of this expression as sort of like a dot product between uh, some sort of, you know, the standard thing, right, where I stack the components into a thing we're used to calling a vector, but is really, you know, not a vector in this more sort of abstract math sense. Uh, that's really a, a matrix of components. Uh, so you can think of it like like this, this kind of idea. You have like the components components, and then you have the um, basis vectors, and the abstract vector over here is like the dot product between the components and the, the basis vectors, right? That makes sense to everybody. This is sort of a, actually kind of a, I don't know, an interesting notation. Uh, these are sometimes, it's called a vectrix sometimes, which is kind of a weird thing. This is kind of standard in the aerospace community where you have to like reason about lots of coordinate transformations all the time. Uh, okay, so what happens now, uh, if I take this thing, I wanna diff this to get V, let's say, uh, like we had up there. So I can say, you know, V equals dr dt, and I can just go ahead and diff that expression, right? That coordinate frame expression. Um, and I'll get like r dot e hat x plus r, uh, uh, then like the time derivative of the basis vectors, right? And um, a sort of obvious thing happens here, which is that the time derivatives of these basis vectors are zero. So they're just sitting there fixed. So we can drop these guys out. And this then reduces to sort of the obvious answer, um, which is just, you know, the stuff you're used to seeing. And you can kind of do this, you know, again and get the accelerations. And that's sort of, again, super straightforward because things, uh, the basis vectors are constant. So no surprises here, you get this thing. And so it turns out that um, if we want to write F equals MA down in Cartesian uh, coordinates, we get the standard thing you're used to. So if we want to be super pedantic about the coordinate frame stuff, we'll get, again, the abstract uh, vector stuff. So I, I'm going to do the F in Cartesian components, and then the MA, again, Cartesian stuff. And I'm going to keep the basis stuff around, right? This is exactly the abstract vector equation that we had before. Kind of the idea is I can stare at this and I can say, okay, well, I can just pull these off. These are the same on both sides, right? So I'll just keep the component equations. And that's, you know, kind of how we get the, the equations we're used to seeing, where we're dropping the basis vectors and just looking at the components. So I'm being like extremely, sort of I'm belaboring this component stuff versus basis stuff a ton. Um, so this is kind of the, Thing we're used to dealing with because what we're going to do next is 
not Cartesian coordinates. So if I make a different choice of coordinates, which is a normal thing to do, um, let's say I you go for polar coordinates instead. Let's write those down. So I'm going to start with my Cartesian coordinates. So I've got my x basis vector, y basis vector. Then I'm going to write like I'm going to write down some, you know, just kind of arbitrary uh, vector r, abstract vectory thing, whatever. And now I'm going to write down uh, the polar basis vectors. So I've got the components in polar coordinates, right, as r and the radius and then theta, the angle. So if I write down the basis vectors for that, the r one oops, is super obvious. The r one is just the unit vector along here, right? So this we're going to call e hat r. And then the, what's the theta basis vector? Yeah, exactly. So it's still an orthogonal basis, blah, blah, blah. So it's, it's yeah, the unit vector perpendicular to, to that one. So we'll call this e hat theta. Let's write these guys down. So what we're going to do now is write down like the conversion between polar and Cartesian. So what we're specifically going to do is write down these two basis vectors in terms of the Cartesian ones. So we have the mapping back and forth. So if I do that, This is like, I'm not going to spend a ton of time on this because this, this should be, you know, you can stare at that and do a little trig. It's not too hard. Okay, so that's that. So here's where it gets weird. Now I'm going to write down like, I'm going to try to take that R guy's derivative. I'm going to try to write down R dot in polar coordinates now, right? And what, what happened before, you know, everything was nice. The basis vectors were constant and dropped out, and then you got this really clean expression. Let's see what happens in polar coordinates. So if I write this guy down in polar coordinates, this is just scalar R times E hat R always, right? Like by definition, basically. Let's try to write down the V vector now. So this is dr dt, and I'm going to expand this out. I'm going to just do you know product rule. So I'm going to get r dot e hat r plus r r dot. Right. Last time that was zero, but just by looking at this, right, if I move r around, this basis has to move too. So what this is kind of showing you, right, is as R moves, these basis vectors are also changing in time. So that this guy, this basis vector derivative is no longer zero. We have to like kind of pay attention to this. And it gets messy. So I will like, I guess we'll go kind of fast and not be sort of, I mean, this is easy, you know, freshman calculus stuff. It's not, not too hard, but we'll write it out. So I'm going to just plug in the definition there of, of like this guy in terms of the Cartesian coordinates, because I know those are constant and I know how to deal with those. And now I'm just going to diff that. Being terrible. Should move this over. Okay, and if I like, sort of like stare at that minus sign post, that looks like this guy, right? So that's this minus sign. We have x post. Uh, e hat y, that's the e hat theta basis vector, right? So this guy is actually 
theta dot e hat theta, which kind of makes sense, right? So if you think about this, if this thing's moving at all, I have this e hat r guy. Um, if it's moving uh, like that, the only thing, so if it moves in the radial direction, the e hat r doesn't change at all, right? Because it's a unit vector. So the only thing that can change is if it, if it rotates a little bit, right? if you're moving any other way other than radially, any change in that guy is got to be perpendicular to e hat r. Does that make sense? So like intuitively from geometry, like that's that's got to be the answer. Okay, so we figured that out. And now, uh, now, right, we, we're, so the game here is we're going to try to write down F equals MA. That's where we're going in polar coordinates. So we got to do this one more time. Uh, so now we're going to do the A. So I'm just going to uh, um, hit this guy again. Okay, and now we're gonna start like simplifying things down. The first term stays, no weird stuff there. Uh, we're gonna like, like start collecting some things. And like pulling out some stuff. So what all I did was go and plug in like this guy that I already knew, right? And this guy, go figure out the same way. So the upshot is if I take this now and like, you know, plug into F equals MA, I get this like pretty gnarly looking component, you know, sort of definition for F equals MA. Okay, that's F equals MA in 2D polar coordinates. That's kind of awful. Um, so the, the main takeaway here is that sort of the reason for doing this is to, you know, give you a taste of the suffering that is trying to do F equals MA on slightly complicated systems. Um, and, you know, uh, the Newtonian sort of formulation, the F equals MA thing, is very much not uh, coordinate invariant. And to make that clear, right, so what, what we specifically mean by that is that the equations of motion in a particular set of coordinates is completely different, right? So here, this does not look anything like the Cartesian version up here, right? Super different expression in coordinates, right? And that's in contrast to the Euler-Lagrange thing, which, you know, with Q's in it, which is the same in any coordinates you want, right? So that's kind of the big deal. Um, and sort of like the corollary to that statement is that this becomes really unwieldy Uh, for anything, you know, more complicated than like a pendulum or whatever. Um, so let's do the pendulum. Why not? Okay, so everyone's seen this before. 
Uh -huh. So what we're gonna do is, so we can like write down, you know, our like Cartesian basis here. And we can also write down, you know, our polar coordinates. So here's say, this is our theta. Um, this is our L. And if we're gonna do the like F equals MA thing, we also have to think about, you know, the full 2D dynamics here. So we're gonna also think about this um, tension force that acts in the radial direction. So as sort of a like, I don't know, hint of things to come. Oh, we got gravity down. Um, how many degrees of freedom does this thing have? Okay, so yeah, um, if we think about this as a as a point mass in 2D, if you didn't have like the string there, it would have two degrees of freedom, right? X and Y or R and theta, right? Um, so if I wrote this in Cartesian coordinates, say, right, I'd have to write down two numbers to specify that guy's position, right? I'd have to write down X and Y. So one way of thinking about this is that, um, you know, it has two DOF and one constraint. So it has basically um, the following. So this position vector R in 2D, right? X, Y, whatever. The norm of that guy for all time has to equal L, that length, right? Does that make sense? So that's my constraint. So in general, if I have some system, I can write down, you know, so in this case, if it's a point particle in R2, the so-called maximal coordinates would be to write down, you know, the full uh, like Cartesian specification of everything. So here that would be two position coordinates, X and Y, and then to write down the constraints explicitly. So we'll do more of that kind of thing, but um, you have this constraint and then we could write down in sort of um, Cartesian coordinates, right? We can write down, F equals this tension force plus mg. Those are the only forces, right? And this has got to be equal to m v dot or m a or whatever. In Cartesian coordinates, I have to explicitly figure out uh, this t, which is actually like coming from the constraint in some sense, right? Whereas in polar coordinates, it works out a lot nicer. So in polar coordinates, I can write down the radial stuff in components. So if I go back over here, I'm going to just plug into the FR line from the polar coordinate stuff. So I get M R double dot minus R theta dot squared. What's R double dot? Zero, right? Because I have that constraint. Right? So that if I diff that, it's got to be zero. Okay, let's write down the um, the theta equation. Also, the the r here. What's this r? L, right? It's a constant. Okay, and then we got the other stuff, the theta part. Again, just plugging into that bottom line up there for f theta. Uh, there is, uh, let's see, what do we get? We get okay. Same story. We got an R dot here. That's got to be zero. So that's going to drop out. So this simplifies down to M. And then, yeah, R equals L, right? ML theta double dot. So uh, from here, I can say a couple of things. The first one is um, that T, the tension force, is equal to minus T E hat R. So it's got to act in the radial direction. It's acting in the minus radial direction, right? 
uh, then I can write down gravity in these coordinates. So what I'm trying to do here, right, is find a part. So this guy is totally, this is going to be an F R only, right? Then the gravity stuff, if I resolve that into like Cartesian coordinates, it's purely, it's minus G in the Y direction in Cartesian. I'm then going to go plug in this coordinate transformation, right? between the R theta and the XY stuff. So I get minus G Okay, now I can sort of pull out this F theta guy. Minus. Hold on. Oh, yeah. There we go. Okay, so that's me pulling out the F theta from this guy, plugging it into the theta equation, right? The R dynamics don't matter because the constraints keeping R fixed, right? R double dot zero. The only stuff I care about is the theta stuff. And I'm plugging in this theta component of gravity. That's the only, the only thing that shows up. And so then at the end, I get like the famous thing we all know and love. So that was like actually a kind of gnarly like application of F equals MA, right? We had to go through all this like gymnastics to get these coordinate transformations to write down, even just write down F equals MA and polar coordinates to get to this, right? Um, so let's write down some oh, other bonus, if anyone knows. So does, does that equation have a closed form solution? It's another fun bonus question. What do you guys think? Any have opinions? What do you think? Yeah. It turns out it does. And I'm not talking about the linearized, you know, simple harmonic oscillator thing. This has an exact analytic solution that almost no one knows about. Just super fun. It's a very like 19th century weird thing that no one cares about anymore. It turns out that has a closed form solution in terms of these things called Jacobi elliptic functions. Anyone heard of those? They show up in a few weird applications, but yeah, it turns out the nonlinear pendulum has an exact analytic solution. Fun fact, in case that ever matters in your life, probably doesn't. Okay, some, some more takeaways though, just to sort of... Let's see. Um, so the constraint there that we had to think about, right? The fact that the length of the pendulum was fixed Um, that's a non-trivial thing to write down in Cartesian coordinates, right? It's a non-linear constraint. Um, but it becomes super simple, trivial, right, in polar coordinates. Let's see. Um, basically, what happens, right, is in polar coordinates, the constraint lines up with one of our coordinates, right? Like that's kind of magic. And then, like, we can basically just ignore that coordinate. Uh, let's see. The other thing that happened is we also never had to, um, explicitly calculate that tension force 
which is sort of cable tension or constraint force. Uh, let's see other things. So yeah, kind of the game here, what hopefully should be coming apparent here is that coordinates are like a huge deal and can make your life way easier or way harder. Um, and in particular, F equals MA doesn't make your life easy when wanting to specify weirdo coordinates. So this is kind of one of the reasons the Lagrangian or the Lagrange step is so powerful and popular is that you can pick your coordinates such that basically all the constraints drop out uh, along different coordinates that you can then ignore, right? So that's kind of the game, which you can't do in F equals MA land, right? And F equals MA land, we have to go through this gymnastics to just get to MA in a particular coordinate frame and then write everything down and then cancel out the unneeded coordinates, right? Uh, so let's see, what else is there? So this system um, has really has one degree of freedom which is just the theta, which we all know. Um, if we want to do it in Cartesian coordinates, so we got to write it down as x, y, and then the constraint, right? Um, so if we can write it down in terms of just one coordinate, i.e. theta in this case, um, we call that uh, minimal coordinates or joint coordinates um, in robotics sometimes. Uh, so minimal because it's just enough coordinates to capture your degrees of freedom, right? So minimal coordinates means you have the same number of coordinates as your degrees of freedom. It turns out that's not always a good idea in general, and we'll get to why. Um, and then it's called joint coordinates in robotics because it classically corresponds to the joint angles on a manipulator arm as like your minimal coordinate set for something like a, a robot arm. Uh, you also hear the term generalized coordinates, which is more of a physics term, which is actually it's often used synonymously with um, minimal coordinates, but it isn't actually the same thing. You can have generalized coordinates that are not minimal. So we won't do that. Um, and then the sort of comments on this, I'd say most current like state-of-the-art robotic simulators use minimal or joint coordinates. Uh, so this is sort of why you've seen, you know, Qs and Lagrangians your whole life. It's because this is kind of a standard thing and this is what, um, most current simulators do. Um, and you might think sort of, you know, that's a good thing. You want to use the least number of variables possible and have the most compact like state vector or whatever. Turns out that's not always a good idea. And it's not even always computationally cheaper to have a smaller state. But intuitively that seems like a good idea, right? Which is kind of maybe why all the current stuff does it this way. Okay, um, so the, there is sort of this opposite extreme uh, where we could, in this case, uh, like write down the full Cartesian position of everything, right? And then write down constraints. So in this case, the, the unit norm or the length L constraint, right, for the pendulum. And then write down explicit constraints. Um, this is often called maximal coordinates 
and less popular for not particularly good reasons, turns out. But um, there have been, you know, situations where, where this is a good idea. I kind of like this, and we'll do more of it, because uh, it actually, like, pretty explicitly exposes structure in the system through the, the joints uh, constraints. But uh, let's see if we get from there. That's probably good for today. OK, I think that's what we're going to call it for today. And we'll pick up because the next time is a pretty pretty big leap. So this is sort of the the soft intro day. Next time we're gonna so next time we're gonna talk about uh, a bunch of weird stability stuff. So has anyone heard of Lyapunov functions before? Yeah, okay, cool. We're gonna do some of that stuff and hopefully do some more some more interesting things. But the, the lesson of the day is uh, you know, coordinates matter. Ethical MA is a real pain to, to deal with weird coordinates. And you've got minimal coordinates and maximal coordinates. And those are kind of, those are the things you should know about from today, I guess. And I'll post this. Uh, we'll send out a survey for scheduling like office hours and stuff. And please fill out the Google form. Uh, I should probably just leave that up. Yeah. Go ahead and take a couple minutes to do that stuff now if you haven't. And I think that's it. And I'll hang out if anyone wants to chat about anything.